Hello and welcome to Drunkards and Taverns. I'm Edward James and I'm the Dungeon Master for the show. Thanks for joining us for our first Tales from the Yawning Player, where we chat to our drunkard to find out how the session was for them. I'm joined by Samuel Nunes D'Souza, or Sartori from the campaign. So first of all, welcome Samuel. Uh, first things first. Hi. How was the hangover? Um, oh, funny story, because, okay, so my friends, anyone who knows me knows, I have never in my life had a hangover. No. Ne- never. Like Sam and Emily, when, when we were on tour, they hated me uh, for it. <laughs> like, how? Uh, all my friends, and like, what's going on? I- this was the first time where I've ever kind of woken up and gone, what's, what's this feeling? I didn't have a headache, I didn't have, but I just was very lethargic. So I don't know whether yeah. that counts as a hangover, I don't know what it is. But I was just very lethargic, and it was lucky I didn't have, have work the next day, because um, I was like, I'm not getting out of my bed. I just, there's, there's, there's no way that I'm doing anything until 12. <laughs> well, I text, you, I text you early in the morning you and was text like, me. hey man, just let me know you're alive. Yeah. And I had no response, and I was like, oh my god, I think we've killed him. <laughs> I was just, I was asleep. I was just like, I was out. I was just drunk. I was gone. I woke up, I woke up around, when I texted you, I just woken up and I looked at my phone and I was like, I mean, I'm not dead. I don't <laughs> feel like I want to leave my bed though. It, it wasn't instant regret. It wasn't, I'm never going to drink again. It was more a case of, I don't like, I don't, if, this, if this is what a hangover is, I don't like it. So have you drunk, have you drunk since recording? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, well, no, recording was the first time I drunk in a while. This show was the first time I drunk since New Year's. Wow! I would say. Yeah. Okay, and we we re- just for everyone we recorded in like March. That's three months off the booze. Y- yeah, um, three that months is low off the tolerance booze. levels. That is low tolerance. That is that is that is gone over days of uni when you could <laughs> when you could do whatever you wanted. <laughs> and also <laughs> because of that, you thought I know I'll drink something that's really low percentage. So what did you go for? I went for gin, and then I ran out of gin, and I thought I had more gin, but I realised that my mum. Um, well, as most black people do, if there's a spare bottle around, they'll just put something else in it. Um, so, <laughs> so what was it? You said it was like some some sort of like magical Christmassy drink or something, right? Yeah, yes, it's sorrel. Like, uh, so in the Caribbean, we we have a drink called sorrel. Um, that we drink mainly at like Christmas time. Um, sometimes it can be with alcohol, sometimes it's without alcohol. I don't know whether this batch has has alcohol. My nan made it, and she's awesome at making it. Um, and but I didn't want to drink it because it's quite it can fill you up it's quite heavy and also quite spicy right, right. so the only other thing that I had next to me was Ray and Nephews um, that was a terrible <laughs> terrible choice so, so I went from gin thinking I had more gin to Ray and Nephews and I'm not a big fan of lemonade and rum lemonade and gin yeah. is fine but lemonade and rum is wrong I didn't have any coke so I was, ended up like having the subpar drink for the majority of the of the of the, um, of the recording, and yeah, I just got <laughs> licked off that. I think it was the rum that kind of got me licked, than anything else, you know. And I don't even know like what the percentage is. Something like sixty-two. It was high. I think yeah, you told us on the you told us on the recording. Uh, I, it was like sixty-two percent. I, I could have lied. Like I could have lied. I, I'm, I'm, it's sixty-three percent. Sixty-three percent. There we yeah. go. There we go. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uncle Ray and nephew, man. Well, I'm, I'm, I, th- I thought I would um, thank you in return. So I'm currently just um, I'm sat here with my favourite cocktail, which is an, uh, a whiskey sour. Um, and uh, so, yeah, to you, sir. Well done. Um, I would cheers you, but I have nothing. I didn't come prepared. Mm. Uh, <laughs> no, disappointed. Let's find out a little bit about you then, because obviously people have only ever heard you, as you described in the podcast, as at your worst. So oh, let's wow. hear... You, you literally said... Did this I is me that? at my worst. Oh, so wow. let's hear oh, it from you at your best. Um, so, and um, <laughs> we'll stop recording. We'll come back to another time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so no, you, God, you're God. Um, you're born and raised in London, right? Yeah. Well, I I say I, I I like to I like to say that I was born and raised in London. I really wasn't. Um, I was born. <laughs> I was, I was you told me this the entire time we've been mates. Yep. <laughs> well, I have to come clean because there's people going to be listening like, like, dude, you ain't what sharp. Uh, um, so no, I was born in Kingston, and then, which is not, I don't count, I don't class Kingston as London, even though it's a borough of London. It's not. It really ain't. Um, so I was born in Kingston, and then around age six or seven, I moved to 
to a place called Epsom, which people know because her, the Queen decides to go over every year for, for to race horses. Um, yep. Epsom Downs. Yep. So like, I like I live there. Um, and yeah, did she have to boot you out to race her horses? Or? Hell no! I don't live. I don't live up on the downs, man. I live. I live in the. I live. I live elsewhere. It's cool. Like I grew up there. Um, yeah, and I've been here for like the last. I would say 20, 25, 24 years now. Yeah, nice. It's, um, it's quite. It's a, it's a nice area. It's a nice area. I would say. You're not. Yeah. You're not Epsom hmm? now. Yeah, I am. I am. Are you? Yeah, bro. I didn't know that. Where, where did he think I was? <laughs> <laughs> We're not honestly, you know. No, this is quite interesting. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm at home at the moment. I thought you were in Brixton. I wish. The, the truth is, is like I've never really. I, I, ba- I'm based at, I'm based in Epsom, but I'm never in Epsom. The, right. the, the lockdown this year has been the longest time I've been in one place, um, in my entire life. I would say I'm always on the move. I'm always on the move. I like to go anywhere, man. Um, because so now, more, nowadays you're yeah. you're an actor, right? Yeah, nowadays I'm an actor. Um, so you go off on tour and stuff like that. Yes. Um, yeah, which is where I met Sam and Emily. And yeah, you. right. And <laughs> me. Yeah, yeah. And, you, and yeah. so so yeah. so we met you on a uh, on a Shakespeare tour, but you now yeah. you run your own uh, theatre company, right? Yes, Obsidian yeah, Theatre. Obsidian Theatre Company. It's 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 new. Um, up and coming this year. This year, I'm still in the early stages of developing it, but um, it, it's basically. It basically came from the fact that I I love all things cultural and and heritage and one of the things I was I've been really coming to terms with in the last decade or so is there is some work that is written by black people. Um that has been been able to been produced and been put on stage um i would say that there hasn't been consistency there yeah yeah i I would say that there hasn't been there's been the opportunity i think for example nine night um which is one of the reasons why i set up obsidian um really affected me in a positive way because it was one of the first times i'd ever seen my culture and my heritage and the things I recognised um, to be my to be my life truths on stage, uh, and witnessed by so many other people that look like me, and I was like, "Wow, this yeah. is awesome! This is this is something that I I want to see consistently, all the time, because it's magical." and so my theatre company is basically celebrating um, African, Caribbean, Black British culture and heritage. Nice. And it's about celebrating the differences between all the islands, all the African countries, and also finding similarities and exposing those and, 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 and creating communication and creating um, comedy and creating drama and creating that kind of stuff that's all that's what i want to do i want to work i want to work with people who who maybe at one point haven't had the opportunity yeah you know um and i want it to be consistent that's my main thing i want it to be good quality theater but it's consistent that is i suppose because um yeah. we're really lucky yeah. like being in london um, we are. i think we see so much more theater and stuff like that that is from um people of different ethnic backgrounds and stuff um, yeah. rather than like those big touring shows that a lot of people see in, in just sure. the um in, you know in, in different parts of the uk or across mm-hmm. the world um and i think even even for us the stuff that we see which is made by those people it's so often in the theaters that aren't on the main strips yeah you know, it's the little theatres, the yeah. community theatres and stuff like that. And it'd be so cool to, to, to bring that sort of work to a much more mainstream audience, um, which it sounds like you, you're looking at doing. That's what I'm looking at doing. I feel I, feel I just want to, yeah, I just want to be able to, I want to be able to look back on my career in the future, right? And say that in some way I helped other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah and help them feel successful and help them feel acknowledged and belong 
and um, exposed to cultures and heritage but they don't really know they don't really understand so for me it's just about i want i want to create a legacy that is positive yeah man and it seems like it's such a, a good time to sort of set up that sort of thing <laughs> this as well. is really with... heavy this going into a really heavy... i'm a very i'm a very serious person i think people can realize um <laughs> yeah we, did, we didn't see that last week but when, when you know when you are acting you still yeah. um you find a lot of time to uh to meditate and do stuff like that because you have quite a, a, a background in sort of martial arts and stuff when you were growing up yeah right? yes um, and looking yeah. at sort of you're saying about how um you want to bring like culture and heritage to the to the to the work that you do um mm-hmm. on stage um how did how did your sort of like your martial arts and, and your uh, meditation and, and your sort of your culture and your sort of like history um shape your creation of sartori because we spoke beforehand and you were saying how you wanted to make sure that you like really looked into some of the um uh, uh like the the kind of witch doctor sort of stuff <laughs> the voodoo sort of stuff yeah um mm-hmm. how, yeah how did all that kind of come together in the character creation okay so we'll, we'll, we'll take the voodoo and the witch doctor stuff first i will do that separate to the martial arts i've always been fascinated by it um and there's not a lot of stuff. I mean, I mean, f- cultural and common uh, opinion would be that it's, it's dark magic and it's evil and all that kind of stuff. And it's just healing. Yeah, it's just healing. Um, and but like everything, there's a light and dark side to things. And you can have, you can use the power to create and to and to heal other people. You could also use because it's, it's mystical power, right? Um, that's where it's coming from, anyway. Um, but you could also use those, that power to do damage uh, and, and harm people. So it's 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 less about the the practice itself and more about the people practicing it, which is very much about most things in life. It is less about yeah. what it is and more about the people doing it. With that in mind, and I'm so I'm going to put a pin in that because that's my voodoo kind of fascination there, and I'm still researching, I'm still looking into it because I don't know a lot. I'm very ignorant. Um, about it and I kind of want to change the ignorance from myself um, and we're going to put it into the martial arts side of things which is I got into martial arts um, from what what is the I was in martial I started martial arts in year three so um, uh, how old are you in year three? three what is that like nine I think I think eight or nine right because I don't know what I don't know what I don't know age you leave like your first school and the the middle school (laughs) Um, I just don't know Um, but year three was the first time I was getting beaten up and racially abused Um, so yeah so that's why I started karate my mom's like you need to protect yourself Um, (laughs) you're one of a few you need to be able to protect yourself Um, out there I can't fight your battles for you Um, do you know what I mean so I was like okay fair enough Um, and one of my first martial arts instructors uh, a man called Sensei Michael Eaton um, since passed he passed when I was 11 years old Um, very big influence on my life Uh, great instructor Um, very nice person and yeah he got me very very far um, into my grades and then his assistant uh, a man called Neil Hack Sensei Neil um, took me on, um, and I was his first black belt in his class. Um, yeah, and from there it was just a case of like I karate. Karate is now a big part of my life. Um, I can't compete anymore. I'm too broken and injured. But I like. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I am. It's true. Um, but I like to to pass on and help and assist. And there's so many, so many wonderful people that you meet. Like in, in in truth, it's one of with karate. It's, it's the only place where you can get like a seven year old black kid training with a fifty year old white guy, um, and you're all buddies and you're all friends and you all and, yeah. and, and you know what I mean. It's it's a comradeship and you're all training for the same purpose and the same goal. And it becomes a philosophy of life, you know. Through my understanding of the philosophy of karate and the the need for balance and the need for harmony and all that kind of stuff I'm a very philosophical person um, and then c- coupled with me finding meditation two years ago um, and it becoming a really big part of my life um, and helping me be very very calm and not as hot tempered <laughs> as maybe I once was 
it, it can't, again, it's just me seeking out a balance. And so this theory and this feeling of, of balance all came with the idea of creating Sartori. And so even the name Sartori, like, because I, 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 I researched it before and I researched, and I researched it just again <laughs> before I was coming on here. <laughs> double um, check. Just to double check. It's one thing about balance. It's one side. It's like a, it's like a Buddhist. Um, one, of the, one of the themes and one of the sayings for it is Sartori is like the Buddhist um, definition of inner enlightenment and searching right. for inner balance, right? And so that is what Sartori is trying to emulate. I don't think it's a spoiler to say which school of monk he's going. No, 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 so no, 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 no. Not no he's, so he's, he's going down the way of mercy. One hand he can heal, the other hand he can kill, he can poison. So it, it all, it's all encompassing. It's just a case of that was where my, um, my train of thought was going with it. I'd never played a monk before and I wanted to do something that was more balanced and healy because we don't have a healer. Uh, but you so were like, like, I don't want to actually just play an I don't out want, I don't want to be an out and out healer. <laughs> I don't want to play a cleric. I don't know whether a cleric would be would go well with, with, with a drunk guy. I just don't know. How, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how well that would go down. Uh, we saw a version of Satori in the last oh, wow. three episodes. Yeah. Um, how, di- how different is he going to be in the next, you know, the next however many? I mean, very. Uh, <laughs> he's going to be very. Okay, so I, I have to tell. I have to become clean, um, audience. I I cannot remember for the life of me what has happened in the last. Episodes. <laughs> I am watching and listening with you to figure out what the fuck is going on. <laughs> um, I listened to all of episode one, and there was a few things I missed out for example when I first described the, ca- the, ca- the camera the character um, first of all uh, he has a pet pseudo dragon um, I loved how like, and I, did, I didn't like touch on that because I was like didn't. I can't wait for this to, for him just to in, in his next recession be like oh by the way I have this <laughs> pet pseudo dragon <laughs> I have a pet pseudo dragon who I saved and now he, he now follows me around everywhere um, Sator- <laughs> Satori kind of like he doesn't really wear a lot of clothes. He's only just got into shoes. Um, <laughs> he's only just got into... He's lived in the woods all his life. He's not, not, not really neat. So he's kind of like very free. He wears um, like a strapless top and like a thing that goes around his waist. He's modest. He carries a spear. Um, he's probably going to get a mask soon because of the way it most gives you that. It'll be a beauty mask. Um, nice. But a, That's good. You know, um, yeah, right. Um, and, but there's just a lot of Sartori. Like he's... He's he's very measured and very like um, <laughs> kind of he's working on himself. He's 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 gone through some trauma, which is probably going to come out later on. Um, and he's and he's um he's working on himself, and so he's jumped at the chance to bond and and try and figure out who he is in this in this arc of his life. Um, with and he's kind of guided thing. by other forces, right? He's kind yeah. of, he kind of uses his oh, yes. he uses um, a bag of bones to kind of oh, um, yeah, make life thing. choices. I forgot. Yeah, he's got he's he's a proper like Rudy slash witch doctor. So he's got a bag of bones that he carries with him, and uh, many difficult decisions. Um, if he's uncertain or if he's pondering something for a long time, he'll he'll use that by dice roll, for example. He'll just use. Um, by the bag of bones to come up and down and, and it will tell him um, what he needs to do and he lives by that whether it's a good decision or not he lives by it he's not averse to communing with the dead um, if he needs to he, he hears voices and that kind of stuff yeah he's um, he's a madman uh, but he's a bit he's, different to what we heard he's, he's a be- he's, he's, a, he's essentially the opposite to what you heard and unfortunately I stopped listening <laughs> halfway through <laughs> you'd like tune back you'd like tune back in at a point where it's like can we do this please and it's like we've, we've already done that so. <laughs> no it's because something had happened and I and I was pondering it but I was being very serious about trying to ponder it because I realised that how far gone I was and so I was using all my energy to like make the right decision but meanwhile everyone else had just carried on going <laughs> and i remember coming back into the room as it were when um ed was talking about um 
people rushing us or something. And I the co- when the kobolds and the goliaths yeah, are running right? towards you. The kobolds are running towards us. Uh, I haven't listened to episode three, so I do not know what, how, how it concluded. I remember it ending abruptly because I was like, I'm going to go on my fifth toilet break soon. I, oh, we finished. <laughs> Sweet. Um, <laughs> and I remember there being like a figure figure somewhere on the side. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. But yeah, Sartori is very different to how um, I played him when I was under the influence of Ray and my nephew. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's going to be it's going to be really fun to kind of see that other side of him. Yeah, um, obviously, will, someone someone had to go first and be the drunkard first. In, in my head, I was like, maybe I should be the first drunkard. I was like, no, that's a terrible. That's idea. a terrible idea. But we, you rolled it. You rolled it fair and square. It was me. I I had a feeling all day that day coming up, and I was something just said to me. Um, I'm a little bit sartori like that. Something just said to me. Um, <laughs> You rolled your bag you're, of bones. You're gonna be the first drunkard, and so I was <laughs> prepared for it. And I was like, if I'm the first drunkard, I, I don't know how experienced everyone else is around the table. Uh, we briefly, we briefly discussed it before. I can't remember for life of me how, um, how experienced people are. I, I've played. I've got four or five years under my belt. That doesn't mean I'm very good at D and D. It just means I, I've played it. I've just played it. So, but so, and I'm fine. I'm not an aggressive drunk. So, which is good. <laughs> you know, good. Um, which I was quite. I was amazed at how much actually like um, nothing too crazy happened. Like, I think. I think when I drink, I'm like, yeah, fuck it, I'm gonna do this. Um, and it was all quite tailored and quite measured, actually. So, how does Satori feel about um, the party as a whole? And like. All he knew he was going to be coming along with Frida and Galas to deliver some wines, and now there's been a massive explosion, and he's been dragged into all this turmoil. Okay, right. So I'm going to answer in two stages. The first stage is I don't fucking know because I don't know what happened. Um, <laughs> I don't know what happened. I can give a better response once I listen to episode three, which is out now already. So you guys. <laughs> uh, but it no so he so in terms of Galas um, he doesn't know what to make of Galas okay? he's got this scar on his face but he seems very diplomatic um, he's not really talked about his his background um, and he just seems like an interesting character to 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 know but, but like all of them really he's not really um, he's not really feeling wary of them yet he thinks Teapot's strange. He's never met anyone like Teapot in his life. I don't think anyone has. Uh, and <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see how that relationship develops because Teapot is completely... Okay, Teapot is as Sartori as much as I was Sartori. <laughs> 100%. 100%. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't, it was going to be very interesting because he seems really cool. Um, Moth... Uh, he's. I think he's fascinated by Moth. And Frida. Frida, the most important one. Frida. Frida's cool. So Frida and Sartori have, have recently become known to each other. Uh, and so their kind of backstory together is finding a solution to uh, to kind of rescue their shared mother. That they, they, are, they, ha- they are of the same mother, not different fathers. Um, and separated by many years Sartori is in his 60s he's an elf so that's still pretty much a teenager but he's got six he's got a few years on her he's got at least three decades on her in that time he's not really seen the world he's only seen his world um, and so coming out and meeting Frida and getting to know her and getting to know the predicaments that his that their shared mother is in it's going to be great to see their development and how they work together to try and find a solution um, and how he feels about Frida at the moment is um I think nothing but love. She is the only living family he has now. How he feels about Frida, he, he really likes her. She's really cool. She plays a really strange instrument. She um, does. She does. And that is awesome. She's very eclectic. She's very strange. Um, she seems great. So, yeah, and, and he's not the most normal person in the world either. What is normal anyway? He's. he's oh, we, this is a ragtag bunch of misfits. Do you know what I mean? This is, the, this is the D&D suicide squad. <laughs> we stick out like a sore thumb. We stick out like a sore thumb. Like, you know. 
like we don't even need. I don't think we need a name. We're just like oh that that bunch. Yeah, them. that bunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. <laughs> percent. Um, so, so when we when we um first started um chatting about sort of character creation and stuff, you you said that there, that yeah. you couldn't quite find a background that quite fit for um uh, for Satori. How, yeah. how did you how did you how did you even like start considering that if if someone wanted to think about homebrewing something but making sure that it was um balanced mm-hmm. how would you do that <clears throat> within any character that i create D D or just with acting pre-established characters i like to know there's a journey going forward right and so yeah. if there's a background that I'm like, doesn't really quite fit. Like, I could have gone Hermit um, if I wanted to with, with Sartori, but it was like the build I want to make, pardon me, the character that I want him to be doesn't fit that. There are elements to him that are so nuanced. Um, and I was searching, I was like, Witch Doctor as a background itself is very, very interesting. I, I, I knew that I wanted there to be I, I i knew that frida was going to be a a, a half elf and so i needed i like a connection with another character anyway when it comes to creating um groups in dnd i think it's very very it's think it's much easier and better if some characters are connected um yes yeah. ed you gave the idea and the allowance that, oh maybe they're half brother and sister and i, and I was both of us were like, yeah, let's do that. It's sick. We both know we're playing elves. It's great. Um, and so because of that, all, with all that considered, it was a case of I needed something that's, that was going to make him meet her and find her. And so it then became, well, some of his parents maybe has to go in there. How are they half siblings? Oh, the mother, because it's matriarchal society. So, boom, saw it. Great. So why is that a thing? Why yeah. is she gone? What's going on there? So then it was a case of, oh, maybe there's a system of um, a, a trait within the family that they kind of speak to spirits and they um, get all that and they, 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 they're very much well-versed in healing and, and harming and that kind of stuff. And, oh, I want to do this Witch Doctor thing anyway. Let's just make Witch Doctor a backstory, uh, a, a background. And so it is. it was a case of circumstance rather than... Um, anything else i didn't like the the build with um the pre-ordained backgrounds each background obviously has a background feature yeah <laughs> uh, what yeah. was your one um so by interpreting the spirit i'm just gonna read it out by interpreting the spirit activity around you or by consulting your tools of divination you can gain guidance from the spirit world this can take form of an insight into the personality or motivation of an npc or a premonition of a possible future or perhaps even an awareness of a spiritual and supernatural disposition of your location. Whatever the result, it will be difficult to interpret, to interpret and often seemingly random. Um, using this feature involves a lengthy ritual, at least 10 minutes, but is not strenuous and can, can be combined with a short or long rest. And that's basically, I would probably be utilizing that when he's meditating, so probably yeah. usually around short or long rest. Um, just yeah, so and I, I think yeah. like that sort yeah. of thing is so important to... Um, like we spoke about it and yeah. um, made sure that I was happy with it and obviously so much yeah. of that is going to be down to me oh, coming God, up yeah. with what those visions are so so mm-hmm. if you are looking at homebrewing your own background or something make sure you run it past yeah. your DM just to, to, to tie it in <laughs> so here's, here's, here's the thing I love as a player to give the dungeon master as much rope to hang my character yeah. I live for it because it's the DM's world. It is. And even it's the DM's world. We are we are creating it, we are shaping it. It's it's their world. It's he or she's world. And so um for me as a player, I always love to give more so there's more scope for my character to, to impact and be in the world. And for me as a player to immerse myself in the world. And so it was. Every, I think it was like every other day. I was like, Ed, I put this thing in. Do you like it? Yeah. <laughs> Ed, <laughs> what, what, what this? It's fine. <laughs> like Ed. No, but it's a case of if you're gonna homebrew, if you, even if, even if you're not gonna homebrew, even if you're just creating a character, I would always try and have a, a dialogue with your DM. Don't just turn up on the first read and be like, Hey, um, I got this character. By the way, I got all this because it's gonna be like, Well, does it fit into the world that you that you're playing in? 
if it doesn't fit into the world that you're playing in, then you're going to have kind of friction from day one, and you don't want friction. It's a fun game. It's a game that you, you play, you, you can play anything you want. Have a communication yeah. with your DM first, or during the creation of a character, so they know where you're coming from, you know where they're coming from, and if there's any kind of um, things that don't match, then you can correct it before session zero. And, I would say and then, before, and then yeah. when you get to session one, get that person to get absolutely wasted and throw it all out the window. Do you know what I mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be like a reintroduction. Um, 100%. I, I, it's going to be a reintroduction. They're going to be like, who the fuck is this guy? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no. I that so you asked my vi- for my advice maybe twenty minutes ago because I just waffle, um, and I do. So I speak. I'm sorry, I can't lie. Uh, it, but my advice would be: if you're going to homebrew it, do it. If you want to homebrew and you and you've got an idea, run with it, run wild with it. But I've always had a phrase. Um, it's a phrase that I learned from uni from a great teacher. It's hold on tightly, let go lightly. Um, if you got nice, an idea, I really hold, like that. I love, and it's, it's something. It's a mantra that I now live with my life through. It's just, it's, it's, it's great. I hold on to ideas, and I allow them to develop. But if at one point they don't work or they stop working for you, adapt, let it go. Let it go. <laughs> no, I'm not going to burst into song because no. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I said it twice. Yeah. I said it twice, and the tune came into my head. Just from remnants we'll to, we'll of like, to pay for it. I'm not for that. <laughs> no, no way. <laughs> like from, Disney from, will <laughs> hang us by the balls. <laughs> well, I mean, that's all the questions I've got. That's all the questions. How do we end got? this? I don't know. Should I ask you questions? No. So when you're drunk, right? I have a question. Yeah. When when you're when when it's your turn to be drunk, who's going to be your like? Um, who's going to be conducting this kind of interview with you? Is it going to be one, or are you just going to be conducting interviews with yourself? It's going to be like a, like an hour long, just Ed, it's going to be an hour Ed long me question. chatting to myself. No, I've <laughs> no idea. I've no idea. But I'm I'm waiting for that the dreaded dice rolls. So there's obviously five players and me. So essentially, mm-hmm. on a dice, I've got three numbers allocated to each of you which leaves two left over. So a crit fail and a crit success on a D20 is me. So uh, so what are you saying? So you're saying on a one and a 20, it could be you? Yeah. I can't. <laughs> no, because it's going to be like some random thing, like we're going to piss him off or something. He's just going to be like, oh, white dragon. Just out of nowhere. White dragon, absolutely. Well, <laughs> just, you know, don't forget, you're, getting, <laughs> you're getting a, a, a 1D4 bonus for your D20 rolls. I'm getting <laughs> oh. that for all of the NPCs. Oh, I, I, that see, that's the scary thing, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. All right then. Yeah. Well, um, hopefully, I think that I, uh, you know, we've definitely um, got to see Samuel in his natural habitat now, yeah. um, and got to know a little bit more about Satori from what we saw last time. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really yeah. excited to see him uh, in the world properly. I'm sure you are as well. Me too. It was fun. What I remembered and what I'm listening back to is even better. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how how this podcast is going to go because um, it's just amazing, and already we're getting such great feedback, right? Um, yeah, hundred percent from 100%. so many. So thank you very much for people who are following us already and listening, and please share far and wide because um, the more you share, the more we can get drunk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Essentially, this is just a bunch of alcoholics trying to find just a good a reason to drink. <laughs> well, that's it from me and Samuel this week. Come back next time for the continuation of the story. All that's left to do is to announce the winner of this week's dice giveaway and to remind you that if you want to be entered into this next competition, go on to the Drunkards and Taverns Instagram page and comment on the competition post tagging a friend. So, the winner this time is Mary Le Fay on Instagram. We'll be in touch soon to organise getting those dice sent out to you. Finally, remember to rate the podcast on your podcast apps. It allows the podcast to be heard by more people and will mean we can start to create even more content. Also, we just want to thank Sirenscape for the amazing sound effects and music. Sirenscape is the perfect platform for your roleplay games, with soundscapes from fantasy to sci-fi. So make sure you check them out at sirenscape.com. From all of us at Drunkards and Taverns, goodbye for now, and raise a glass. Raise a glass.